respected guests, esteemed speakers, and uh, distinguished panelists, um, salam alaikum. Um, thank you for being here. Uh, I'd like to welcome you all today uh, for today's uh, panel discussion, developing private market sector for financing long-term uh, projects. Pakistan as a developing country has um, significant infrastructure needs, and unfortunately that's coupled with a significant financing gap uh, as well. Historically, the public sector has uh, played a major role in that domain, uh, but increasingly for various reasons, budget constraints and others, uh, the private sector needs to raise their hand up and needs to be crowded in. And I hope we will touch upon key aspects as to how we could uh, take this way forward. So Zafar Saab, you know, based on your vast experience in the banking sector, um, you know, in your opinion, what's been their role in developing infrastructure in Pakistan? And how do you see it evolving um, going forward? Thank you, Moeen. Um, thank you, uh, Infazam, for inviting me to this very important conference. Um, I have a special relationship and bond with, with Pidge, uh, as Leith mentioned. And um, you know, it's, it's really good to be, um, be here today sharing some thoughts on very difficult question that Moeen has put to me. Um, especially because, uh, you know, um, if I were to be honest, then my community won't be very happy with me. But nevertheless, uh, as you rightly pointed out, you know, um, in order to explain the whole situation, let me just try and um, share with you the perspective of the banking industry in Pakistan and a bit of a history. So, so in 60s, 70s and 80s, it was absolutely the public sector specialized institutions which did the trick for Pakistan as far as the infrastructure financing was concerned. But since 90s, the equation changed. These uh, specialized institutions due to lack of governance evaporated. Um, but at that time, you know, uh, their role was kind of split. Uh, the structuring piece, which is, a, which is the most important piece when it comes to project financing or infrastructure financing, um, was taken over by these international financial institutions uh, and particularly the banks were very active then. They, they actually had a very thriving um, a project financing teams on the ground. And then of course they could resort on, the, on their international connections as well to get the best um, uh, examples to replicate. So Citigroup, ANZ Grindlis at that time, um, even the World Bank was involved in Hapco project, the structuring and all, um, that was all done. Uh, in, the, in the road projects, it was ADB, for example. They made a major role in terms of structuring. The funding piece also came from them, but the local funding was catered to by the local uh, commercial banks. Then, then another wave came through. Um, these uh, international financial institutions exited Pakistan or depleted their operations and then the commercial banks had to take the burden forward for, for doing the infrastructure financing. They lacked expertise. There is a serious problem as far as the asset liability is concerned. If you look at the, you know, the, the, the statistics, only 1.2% of the total deposits are beyond five years. Of the total 23 trillion that we are talking about. And then, you know, um, it needed a better treasury, treasury management also because if you look at the current and saving accounts, those are around 17 trillion. Um, and if I and we ran uh, a regression on it, it, and we think that you know a 50% of that could be used for a long-term uh, sort of uh, 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 positions. So all in all, the funding pot was also merely you know 8 trillion rupees. Today, if you look at the outstanding of the infrastructure financing or project financing, it's around 3.5 to 4 trillion rupees. So that pot of 4 trillion is still available out there, but the requirement is so mammoth uh, for the future. And just to give you a sense, if I were to plot a 10-year GDP forecast for Pakistan, the requirement is around, and, and the backlog of infrastructure the requirement is around um, 5 trillion rupee a year for project financing and infrastructure financing. Not going to happen 
through this kind of funding pot. Um, and if I were to take into account the, the government's, uh, you know, uh, support there as well, we are talking about, you know, around 1.5 trillion coming through next year. In the last five years, by the way, and I'm including both the provinces as well as the federal government, the contribution was merely 8 trillion rupees in the last five years, which is nothing. And that's why you have a larger backlog available there. So all in all, you know, there is, the banks have not done enough. And I don't think they'll be able to do enough going into the future either, until and unless there is a real shakeup in the frames, framework and the incentive structure which is out there is put in place. Uh, when I say this, PPP structure, somebody talked about, uh, you know, the tech structure, the capital relief structure to the banks, all these have to come together. And then, of course, the ecosystem has to work. The bourses have to deliver as far as the secondary market is concerned. The pension funds have to participate. The insurance companies have to come through. The starting point is to get that asset cross right, and then the liability will be stretched on a term basis and we can attract that funding from uh, pension funds and, and insurance companies. In your opinion, how can we shift the banking mindset to, to support longer term financing, 15 to 20 years, or is that even possible for, for banks considering the, you know, the amount of funds that are required? There are certain prerequisites, <clears throat> starting with uh, the existence of the dormant borrower. Um, you know, I looked at the number this morning only and you know, in February alone, the investment of the bank's deposits into, into government security is 83 percent. So, merely 17 percent is out there for the private sector. The challenge here is that the government has to uh, make certain moves. And I say government because the starting point is the government here. They can't do that on their own, especially with the difficult economic environment. Uh, but more so, the funding requirement is so large that the government cannot prioritize that as the thing. The private sector has to come through. Mahin quoted the example of Nigeria. In Nigeria, that was the government pension fund which did that bond. In Pakistan, and Yasser was just mentioning that, in Pakistan, the government pension f are unfunded. So the large port is missing there. Yasser has been very kind by saying small little things. I think there are larger things which are required to be done from a policy level to actual action on the ground before you know this kind of thing is available for the, for the banks to take it forward. Um, another tragedy, I would say tragedy, uh, I am a bit of a non-conventional when it comes to these things, uh, has been the privatization of the, of the banks as well. Uh, the priority, the foreign banks existed, the local banks did not have the expertise, they probably will, will struggle to get those expertise and the institution like Infrazamen has to bring that on the table, Pitch has to bring that on the table. The public sector also privatized, 80% uh, of the assets were privatized, the banking assets. And the result is that the priority just disappeared and with this kind of dominant borrower out there, uh, until unless you make the infrastructure investment attractive more than this, this investment, uh, the, the, the government paper, the banks will never come through. So there is a serious shift required in terms of tax incentives, in terms of, as I said earlier, PPP framework needs to be more robust. Um, the, the Infrazamin is the first entity, frankly speaking, I would like to see many more of Infrazamins coming through. Pension fund, I have mentioned to you. Insurance needs to be more aggressive, but the starting point is the asset availability. And asset availability will only come through if the blended finance is out there, if uh, institution like Infrazamin and all are more active and the government needs to take certain measures, as I said, on policy level and otherwise, uh, to make things work on the infrastructure financing. Otherwise, it will be a it will be a challenge to go beyond. As I told you, you know, mainly 266 billion, 1.2 percent of the total deposits are in. It's it's neither here nor there. Um, I'm going to take some liberty. I'm going to ask you for another follow-up. Uh, you, mean, you mentioned blended finance. Um, so, in your you know, based on your experience, uh, how's the receptiveness of the banking sector towards blended finance, and how could we possibly encourage more innovativeness? Yeah. So, so in terms of need, obviously, it's. it's it can't be debated. 
It's required from two main reasons. One, uh, the expertise piece, as I mentioned, that has to come from them. The other one is that, you know, it has to be from a risk sharing perspective. Uh, but the receptiveness of the banks is lacking primarily because there is lack of understanding for this product. And the second one is because the lack of motivation also. The banks are not motivated to take any f risk, extra risk, especially in this environment where, you know, as SVB example is, by the way, a very real example for Pakistan as well. We need to be very clear that this could happen here too. Uh, obviously, there are certain marginal banks or stronger banks, but we need to be aware the banks will always be risk averse. So until unless the realization, the blended finance, and the public sector has to play a major role. Uh, even I, if I stretch the, uh, the pedigree of Pidge, it's all public sector. I mean, we're talking about the first world. It's all public sector. What's the problem in public sector taking that view? I, it's really beyond me. Mm -hmm. And we have this strange concept of throwing baby <coughs> with the bath water by saying that, you know, just privatize everything, government can't run anything. No, I don't agree with that. There are islands of excellence. There are governance issues which you need to address. But please do not make a blanket this thing that it has to be done. When I was on the board of State Bank of Pakistan, at that time, you know, I had uh, made a presentation to the board that perhaps our, and at the focus at that time was primarily how the infrastructure financing can be supported on the liquidity side. So the largest repository of liquidity in Pakistan are the banks, uh, as Farooq said rightly. And if they are not very progressive, if they are not taking the step forward, then that repository will never be never be out there for development projects. So I had presented a paper to them saying that commercial banks, which are the largest repository of the deposits, they need to keep uh, their horizon of lending because this is the best we know. We are a working capital uh, uh, trained banks and bankers. We can't look beyond three to five years. And, but for infrastructure financing or project financing, you require a long-term funding. And that's where the role of specialized institutions come into play. And that's where the institutions like DFIs, the joint ventures that we have five or six, they should be given, and it requires a shake-up in the, in, the, in, the, in the regulatory uh, framework. The liquidity should be passed on to them, and they should be then specialized uh, uh, in, in doing that project financing, infrastructure financing. Uh, I would now go to the extent of even saying that they should pick up those specialized areas where they can extend those funding. For example, they could be one of the DFIs which will only focus on the climate financing. It's a very specialized area, uh, so on and so forth. So therefore, a, a major shift is required all across the mindset, the policy, and the real actions on the ground to make things work uh, in this space. Thank you, Zafir.